Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be looking at setting up restriction digests and also loading a gel. Okay, so let's get the big scare math out of the way first. What you have here is a table that's asking you to figure out what volume of your sample you need to use. So recall to last week, uh, you guys determined the concentrations of your samples, at least I hope you did, uh, or at the very least you have some uh, absorbance values. Okay, so absorbance values, remember you measured your absorbance at absorbance at 260 and an absorbance at 280 microliter, uh, nanometers. Okay, and so chances are you had some numbers, maybe you had an absorbance that was 0 0.050 as your A260. Again, I'm just using this number because it's a nice round number, it's easy for me to work with. Um, again, you guys had whatever number you had. And there was a number here for 280 that was probably a little bit lower than this, okay? And so in the end, hopefully your A260 over A280 was one point something, okay? Hopefully close to 1.8, but I don't think anybody got close to that. So but about probably 1.3, 1.2. Um, so basically what that tells you is that your DNA is not pure which we're not really expecting to be pure uh, the DNA prep, the mini prep is a pretty quick and dirty sort of method it's not going to give you pure DNA Okay. what I'm going to work with today is this number over here the A260 number this is an absorbance value Okay. so we're going to turn that into the DNA concentration now again because your sample is not going to be pure it's not going to be a very accurate number but it's going to give you a rough idea of how much DNA you might have in your sample Okay. so with this number over here I'm going to turn that into DNA concentration. Okay, so the formula you're going to use is A260, so whatever you got at A260 times 50 nanograms per microliter times dilution factor. Okay, that's going to give you, that's going to convert this number in here to amount of DNA. Okay, the concentration of DNA in your sample. Okay, so in my case, if I have an absorbance of 0 0.05, multiply that. Now, absorbance doesn't have units, so I'm not going to put in units for that. Times 50 nanograms per microliter times my dilution factor. Uh, this number was for the 100 fold dilution. Okay, so I'm going to use 100 as my dilution factor because I want to know what was the concentration not of the cuvette that I was measuring but the concentration of the original sample that I took out to make that dilution okay and so if we take this this is going to be 0 0.05 times 50 that's 2.5 times 100 so it's going to be 250 micro sorry nanograms not not micro nanograms per microliter okay so that means that my sample the epi tube that I have sitting in my freezer right now so this is my DNA that I have extracted has a concentration of 250 nanograms per microliter okay now if you look at this table over here I am asking you to use one microgram of DNA for your digests okay so how do you figure this out concentration of your sample in here would be for example 250 nanograms per microliter of course that could be the same thing as saying 0 0.25 micrograms per microliter okay so that's my concentration that might be a bit more useful for this and so if I take this and I say okay I want okay one microgram I have 0 0.25 micrograms per microliter okay so how much of this how many microliters do you need to get to this okay so how many microliters well in my case you just basically I'm going to give you the answer is 4 microliters because if 4 multiplied by this will give me one microgram but the way you figure it out is you take your one microgram what you want 
divide that by what you have in terms of concentration, 0 0.25 micrograms per microliter, the micrograms will cancel out and so you're going to have 1 divided by 0.25 which will give you 4 and the microliters because it's in the denominator of the denominator it flips over into the numerator and so you get volume here okay? so the units here will be 4 microliters okay? so that's the basic area math which means that in the end here what the volume I would need is about 4 microliters of my DNA sample again you go into the calculations for yourselves based on your numbers and try to figure that out based on that once you have this number over here you are going to take this number and plug that in here so let's say this is my plasmid one then I need four microliters of this in this digest and for this digest as well oops that's not four microliters in here and in here and this one here you're gonna figure out based on how much you have plasmid you're gonna figure out how much water so again we want to have a total volume of 20 microliters in this digest we have a total of six microliters of different components being added to this and plus four that's going to be 10 microliters in total which means you need 10 microliters of water now for this one this is our negative control does not have an enzyme it's going to be our uncut okay and so here we have four microliters plus four microliters of your plasmid which means you have a total of eight which means we have 12 microliters of water we need to add to make a total volume of 20 microliters okay so again based on your numbers that you get from this you are going to figure out this number here this number goes into this row on this table okay once you have that add these up subtract from 20 to give you the amount of water that you need to have so that you have a total volume of 20 microliters okay so hopefully that helps you figure out uh, how to prepare for this lab okay so here we are uh, we're about to set up the digests now what I have in your ice bucket or what you will have in your ice bucket are your samples of DNA or you may have to put those there yourself so I have my DNA with TE and DNA with TER that's the one that was treated with RNAs so should have no RNA in this this might have RNA at least probably does you also have a sample tube that contains some BSA which is going to be required for the enzymes to function properly in this case you also have a sample of 10x buffer now this is a buffer that's going to be used for both of your enzymes so we just have one of these tubes uh, some enzymes do not have compatible buffers so in those cases you may need to be doing digest with two separate different buffers okay in this case we have two enzymes that actually will work well in this buffer so we're using the same one just for simplicity you also have your two enzymes you have the small one and your BAMH1 enzymes in here Okay, so those are pre-measured out for you. Uh, they're not measured out, so you're gonna have to pipette out the appropriate amount. They just each of you has your own set of enzymes and so on. And there's also some water. Okay, and so we're going to set up these reactions, and so you're gonna see why we need these or how we use these racks to help us set up the reactions. So I need first of all some epi tubes. So let's get some epi tubes out. Oh, too many. I'm going to just need four of these. I'm going to label them. So the first one's gonna be P1. This the wrong tip. This is the tip that's dry. Yeah. Okay. Let's try the other tip. So this is P1. This is plasmid one with enzyme. So P1-E. This is P1 dash negative P1-N. Okay. And this is P2 plasmid two. So that's your TER P2E and P2 plasmid 2 negative so this is going to be the one that does not get enzyme okay so here they are ready to go I'm going to open these guys up and get them ready for action okay so now what I need is to add water to these so remember from your table you have um, 10 microliters or 12 microliters to add so I'm going to add 10 microliters to my first set of tubes that's going to be 10 this is a P100 P100 okay and so 0 1 0 that's 10 microliters okay I'm going to put on a tip and I'm going to add the water to those two tubes that require 10 microliters so that's tube number one and tube number three 
Okay, so there we go. That's tube one. And tube three requires 10 microliters. I'm going to move those over by one so I know those are done. And I'm going to change the volume on this to 12 microliters for the next two tubes. And I'm going to add 12 to tube number two and tube number four. Move those over as well. On that tip we can get rid of. Okay. Now the next thing we're going to add is actually going to be the buffer. Okay. And so I need two microliters of that, so I'm not going to be using this micropipette. I'm going to get a P20, which is this one here. Okay, so P20, this one, P20 is set currently to 0, 050, 0, so that's 5 microliters. I'm going to change that to 0, 020. 0. And that's going to be two microliters. Now, again, the reason that we're using two microliters is not some random number. Uh, this is a 10x buffer. Okay, so that means it's 10 times more concentrated than it needs to be. That's working concentration would be 1x. Its current concentration is 10x. Okay, and so that means that I need to dilute this in order for it to have the appropriate concentration. My final volume is going to be 20 microliters. My final concentration will be 1x. My initial concentration is going to be 10x. So you can use C1, V1 equals C2, V2 to, to calculate what volume to use, and that it happens to be 2 microliters. Okay, so I'm going to add that to every one of these tubes. Again, I'm doing this because it's the same buffer for all tubes, and so it doesn't really matter if I change my tip or not. I don't have to change my tip here because it's just going into clean water. So I'm just going to add this to tube number two. Move that one over. To number three, move that one over, and to number four. It's all the exact same buffer. Again, there's a reason why I chose to use these specific enzymes, because they do have a compatible buffer. And so here I am. I have water and buffer in here. Again, it would be helpful to have a table next to you if you want. That'll help you keep track of everything. Okay, so from now on we have a buffer in all of these things, so we're not going to be cross-contaminating our samples with the buffer, so I'm going to be changing tips in between. Okay, and so again from now on I'm just going to start adding things one at a time. And so I'm going to add t the first DNA, DNA1, into these samples. So tubes 1 and 2 get DNA1. I'm going to take 2 microliters of that. Sorry, that one's supposed to be 4 microliters, so I should change the volume on this, shouldn't I? So let me change the volume to 4 microliters. Okay, 0, 4, 0. So here it is, 4 microliters. I'm going to change the, add the DNA now. So 4 microliters goes into tube number 1. And, okay, 4 microliters goes into tube number 2. Okay, so notice that as I'm doing this, each time I am moving things over by one space. This way I know how far along I am in my procedure. So even if someone distracts me at this point with some question, I can still get back to it and remember exactly what I'm supposed to be doing next. Okay, so at this point I know I've already added my water, I have added, that's this one, I added my buffer, now I've added my DNA, this one still needs DNA. Okay, so I'm going to take my DNA sample 2, I'm going to add 4 microliters of this one, to tube one. And four microliters of this DNA to tube number two. Okay, so I've got DNA in all of them. I have my buffer in all of them. I'm going to add BSA. And then in this case, again, I need to go back to two microliters. So I'm going to change this back to two. Okay. And so BSA goes into all of them. Again, each time we're going to change tips. So BSA is done here. Next two goes in. Again, notice that I am opening up the lid each time and closing it. Uh, in this way, 
the lid of the tips. This way I minimize the risk of contaminating the rest of the tips. So a lot of the times I see students just kind of leave this thing, oops, leave this thing open like this for the whole lab. At that point, those tips are no longer sterile. There's no guaranteeing that these things are sterile at this point. So you want to make sure that you keep these closed as much as possible. So I've done my BSA. And again, I got just distracted to tell you about this stuff, but I know that I finished my BSA because all the tubes are moved over. Okay. So at this point, all I've got left is just the enzyme. And so again, the first two tubes get a small one. So I'm going to add two microliters of small one to these. Okay. And that's going to go in. And again, this one does not get small one. That's right. So, oops. so that should be over. That should be over. So BAM H1. And again, you can move this one over here already. So you know how to add BAM H1 to this one. And add BAM H1 to tube number three. And here we are. Okay. Now you can close all of these. Now in my case, I was adding all of these to the bottom fairly carefully and so all the liquid or most of the liquid at least is oops where they are most of the liquid is at the bottom of the tube uh, if you find that your liquid isn't all at the bottom then what you can do is just take these into the microfuge and spin them down briefly for 30 seconds at whatever speed really will do it okay so that all the liquid is at the bottom and then you're going to take these over to the water bath and incubate them now technically small one is an enzyme that can cut quite efficiently at 25 degrees Celsius uh, and so you could technically just leave it at room temperature on your bench um, whereas well probably not at room temperature in here because it's a little bit cooler than that but 25 degrees would be a good temperature to have 37 degrees Celsius is not the most efficient temperature but it still cuts relatively well whereas damage one does cut quite well at 37 degrees Celsius so we're gonna put all of these tubes at 37 degrees Celsius instead of having different temperatures okay so that's uh, we can just put everything in one place and not worry about it. But again, different enzymes will have different optimal temperatures. And so it's important to understand that you don't just put everything at 37 degrees Celsius every single time. Um, basically, depending on which species the enzyme was extracted from, was purified from, that enzyme will work best at a particular temperature. So our samples have completed their incubations at 37 degrees Celsius and at 65. So our enzymes have been inactivated. Now, when I was taking them out of the water bath, I immediately put them into an ice bath or uh, your ice bucket. Uh, and so you will notice that there is condensation on these tubes. Okay, uh, And so before we can do anything else, we want to make sure that we keep all the liquid at the bottom of the tube. So what we're going to do is we're going to spin these down in the centrifuge. So I'm going to wipe these down. I don't want to be putting extra water into these centrifuges. So I'm going to wipe down the outside and put them into the rotor, wipe these down, and then I can just put them side by side and balance them. Okay, and just make sure they're balanced. And here, that should be balanced four empty spaces on either side so that's balanced as far as I can tell put the lid on close it without slamming the lid shut and we're going to increase the speed to something a little bit more reasonable the actual speed really doesn't matter um, we're just gonna do a quick fairly brief spin it's just there to spin down all the liquid to the bottom of this microfuge tube. Okay. Okay. So, 30 seconds. Okay, so we're done. Okay, let's take the cap off, and so now all the condensation ah, should be at the bottom of the tube. So again, we have 20 microliters exactly at the bottom of these tubes. If you can see that. Okay, so 20 microliters exactly at the bottom, no condensation on the sides, so I can set these down. 
and these guys out as well. Okay, so this is P2, E, and N, E and N, so this is in the right order. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add some loading die to these. The loading die is going to add some density to the sample. Okay, so that's why we want to add this is to make sure that our samples are a bit more dense so they sink to the bottom of the wells. There's a P20, there's a, a die that we're going to be using as a 5x die. So we need 5 microliters of it. So it's going to be 1x at the end when we have 25 microliters. Okay, so I'm going to bring this up and oh, where are my tips? Okay, so. I'm going to go into tube 1. Okay. Do this really quickly. Oops. That's tube 1 is done. Tube 2. little bits. Okay, we need a new tube for you guys for tomorrow. There we go. Four. I didn't bring my waste beaker, so that's a little annoying. Okay. This cable's not getting in the way too. Okay. So I'll get rid of these later. Or right now. Okay. So now I have 25 microliters in each of these tubes. Now I don't see much that's along the sides, so I can probably just go ahead and use them as they are. If you end up with having some liquid splashed up along the sides of your tubes, you can just basically go back and put them back into the centrifuge and spin them down again for 30 seconds. Now I'm going to be loading 25 microliters of this sample into my gel. So I'm going to set this to 25 microliters. And it's a P100. So 0, 025 is what I'm looking for. That's 25 microliters. Okay. I'm going to put on a tip. Move this a little closer. And let me show you loading the gel. Okay. So what I've done is I've drawn a kind of a pink sort of line underneath this thing so you can see the wells a little bit better. Hopefully this helps, because the wells can be a little difficult to see sometimes. So you guys can hopefully see the, the wells relatively well here. Okay, and so I'm going to load, um, I'm going to leave the first well blank, that's going to be for the molecular marker, and I'm going to load the next four wells after this. Okay, so my first sample, P1E, 25 microliters. exactly 25 and so the trick to loading a gel properly is to make sure that you're using both hands one hand is planted so I usually have it on the on the bench and have my fingers up against the side of the gel apparatus I'm going to use my finger to help guide my tips so that otherwise your hands are going to shake okay so always have one finger close to the tip and it's going to guide your tip into the well and so right there that's I'm in the well now and just eject slowly. And you'll notice that this the sample is actually sinking to the bottom of the well. There's a little bit of leakage. And again, if you work slower um, and eject slowly, you'll have less of it leaking out. If you work quickly, you'll probably end up with a lot more leaking out. The trick is don't go too deep. You want to have your tip just um, at the very tip, the very, the very top of the well. You don't want to go too deep because you could puncture the well. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this tip. And I'm going to load the next sample. Okay, so again, 25 microliters into the next well. Okay, there it is. 
and again just plant yourself so that you're, you're secure your hand is not shaking your tip is not shaking you can guide your tip into the well and just slowly eject into the well okay again let me do another one Okay, so just be patient. This is a bit more viscous because um, the loading die tends to contain glycerol, which makes it was what makes it more heavy, more dense. And again, use your finger to help guide your tip into the well, just above the top of the well. Slowly release the contents. Go to the first stop. Don't go to the second stop on this one because when you do, you're going to blow extra air bubbles into your well, which might displace some of the liquids. So just go to the first stop and you'll be fine. Okay? The capillary action of the liquid is actually going to pull your sample out of your tip, so don't worry about going to the first stop. Again, last sample. I'm going to mix it really quickly and take up my 25 microliters. Again, be patient. Don't press too hard. If you press too hard into the bottom of your well, of your um, uh, epitube, you want to block the actual opening to your micropipette tip. And so you want to just gently press down to the bottom and really take up all the liquid from the bottom. Okay? And again, last one. Again, use your finger to guide the tip into the well just at the top. You can see it's starting to already leak out and go to the bottom of the well. That's the density working for you here. And again, just very slowly release. Okay, and then there you go. That's my four samples loaded, and I'm ready to go. Okay, so I'm just going to show you one more thing really quickly uh, before I finish this video. I'm going to close this up. Whenever you're doing electrophoresis, before you leave, always check to make sure it's actually running. So there's a power supply right there. I'm going to turn it on, so I'm going to set it to 100 volts and hit run. And so the power supply, some of them don't really check to make sure that they are running properly. So they will go to a number that you set and say, okay, we're running. But you want to make sure that it's actually properly running. And the way to do that is to look at the negative electrode, which is the one that's black. Okay. And so the negative electrode here, if you look at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it very well. Let me just take this off so you can zoom in. There are air bubbles coming off the negative electrode. Hopefully you guys can see that. Okay, there it is. So you can see air bubbles coming off the negative electrode. If you see air bubbles, that means that the current is running. So electricity is going through this, and it's going through your sample. Okay? Do not leave the apparatus. Do not leave the gel if you're running it ever without checking the negative electrode to make sure it's actually running. Sometimes the actual power supply will tell you one thing, but there may not actually be anything going through your gel. So make sure that the negative electrode actually is producing air bubbles because that tells you that it is actually running. Okay? So, we'll see you in the next video.